I'm Bonnie Stacy, Chief Curator of the Martha's Vineyard Museum, and I'm going to show you some interesting things, some of my favorite things with terrific stories attached to them. But there's one real story that all of these things have in common, and that is that they were here from the very beginning of the Martha's Vineyard Museum, when it was founded almost 100 years ago in 1922, 23, it was over that period of time, um, as the Dukes County Historical Society. And what I'm hoping to show you is some of the ways that the, the way we collect now is the same as the way we used to collect, or maybe it's different from the way we used to collect. And, and I'm going to be talking about a few of the things um, in terms of whether maybe we would have taken it now or not. And so I am going to start out um, with, a, with a word from the founding documents of the um, Dukes County Historical Society. Gift of M. Shepherd. Logbook of Bark Laconia and Schooner Hattie E. Smith, Rufus W. Gifford, and Edward S. Ripley Masters, 1867 to 1872 and 1876 to 1879. This is one of more than 120 ship's logs in the collection of the Martha's Vineyard Museum. It's one of the, the types of things that are undeniably the sorts of things that we collect here because it reflects the whaling industry and the history of Martha's Vineyard so well. And so from the very beginning, um, people who were giving um, gifts to the um, then Dukes County Historical Society knew that whaling history was very important to Martha's Vineyard. And we have been collecting whaling logs ever since then, and we, you know, hope to continue because each one of these adds to the story. These log books are uh, both informative and occasionally quite beautiful. This isn't one that has a lot of artwork in it, but it does have uh, the stamps of uh, the ships that, have, that are seen, and usually there's a description of, spy, of sighting the ship in the distance. It'll have the name of the ship that they see. And so you can go through these and look, and some of the stamps also have uh, when whales were sighted, when they were killed, and um, sometimes when they got away. And, and those stamps are also um, throughout this logbook. And so it's these pieces, these logbooks, have so much information that they're now being used, not just to find out what happened, you know, on a particular voyage in the past, um, but sometimes they're used to study climate. If, if weather observations are made, you know the date, you know exactly where the vessel was, what was the climate like um, at that time, or the weather at that point. Those kinds of things are, you can deduce from these log books. As I said, the museum has more than 120 of these, and they have all been scanned and are available to look at online uh, in the Internet Archive. And so that's another way that the museum is trying to share its collections with the public. Every one of these pages can be viewed and read as its own different image online. And so it's, it's just a, another way that this vast story can be shared with the public. But what this really shows is what was important to be saved in 1923. The founders of the Dukes County Historical Society, what did they consider important? Well, they considered whaling logs to be something definitely worth saving. Gift of Mrs. Charles Perry, in memory of her father, Charles H. Shute, and brother, Richard G. Shute. The collection of stereoscopic neg negatives of Charles H. Shute and son, Richard G. Shute, 
1923. Richard Chute died in 1923, and so his sister inherited all of his glass plate negatives from his studio and she gave them to the brand new Dukes County Historical Society. Glass plate negatives are both stable and delicate. They are great for holding the image and the image will stay crisp and wonderful for a hundred years or more. Um, we have had all of our um, glass plate negatives scanned and now they are available uh, for people to look at. We'll be uploading them as time goes on. But we have hundred, literally hundreds of them and they're a wonderful record of, the, of Martha's Vineyard during this particular era, of right around the late um, the late 19th, early 20th century. We have them all carefully stored in these, uh, in these archival boxes. Each negative is wrapped in a folder to keep it from getting uh, rubbed against abraded. And then we really virtually never need to get back into these. Uh, so they're just being preserved for posterity. And um, as I mentioned, they're very stable unless, of course, you drop them. The, the, the glass will break and sometimes you will see uh, an image that has a crack down the middle. Uh, it means that somebody has dropped it. Sometimes they've been stored in poor condition and so the, um, the image will start flaking off the, the surface. But the, surf the, the glass itself is very stable um, and it doesn't curl and do things that paper does. And so it is a wonderful medium for preserving photographic images over time. So we had a wonderful volunteer come in and um, scan all of our glass plate negatives. His name is Hal Garneau, he's a wonderful person. and. Um, he, he helped us identify them, and it's just been a really great um, addition to our cataloging and helping people come in and find the images that they are looking for from Martha's Vineyard history. And so um, the one that I just held up, I'm not going to open it up, but, but it is um, just identified as spectators lined up on shore, and it shows um, you can see the, um, the, there are boats, there are lots of people, you can see some railroad tracks, um, and it it's just gives you an idea of the way the vineyard looked at a particular point in time. And if you look at all of these photos together, just one after another, you just got an idea of the, the, the vibrancy of this place. Uh, Richard Shute uh, would, would sell these. These were their stereo views. That's why you see two of them next to each other. People would use a stereoscope to view them, and they would actually see a kind of a three-dimensional image. Each side was slightly different, and so your, your eyes would see a, uh, a, a, the optical illusion of a three-dimensional image and so and it was a big thing back before tv and you know moving images were uh, something that you could have in your home and so people would have huge collections of these stereo views and uh photographers like richard Ch richard shoot and charles shoot his father would take photographs of various tourist places and they would sell them to the people who were coming to Martha's Vineyard as, uh, as mementos of their visit. And there are hundreds of them and people collect them, you can find them online. Our collection is huge and it's not just things made from these glass plate negatives but also um, ones that we do not have the negatives of that people have collected and then donated to the museum over time. And it gives us a wonderful perspective on the way Martha's Vineyard looked a um, hundred or more years ago. Um, the, the interesting thing about these is because uh, we know when they came into the museum and we know when the photographer died, we know that they're all older than 1923, um, some of them quite a bit older. 
Uh, and so uh, it's like these are the things that were considered interesting for tourists around that time. Um, and so it's, it's, it's really kind of fun to compare them to the sorts of things that people buy now um, and, and take home as souvenirs. And um, stereo views are not among those things anymore. Gift of Mrs. Everett A. Davis and Mrs. Johnson Whiting. Piece of a soldier's blanket used in the Civil War. This is a relic, almost an object of reverence. It, it's just a piece of, of cloth. It has no meaning unless you know what it came from. So this piece of information is very important because otherwise you would see this and you would think, well, that's interesting. It's a plain weave, it's indigo colored. I, I see some stitching on it, but you really can't tell anything about it until you know that it came from a blanket. It was used in the Civil War by a Union soldier. It came into the, the museum in 1923 um, because at that time, almost uh, 70 years after the end of the war, people were looking back at that time in their history to uh, think about the sacrifices of vineyarders who went off to fight in the Civil War. Um, most of these men had died by then. Um, and an object like this in a historical museum or historical society was meant to signify more than just here is a piece of cloth. It was a, a way to show respect for the history of the vineyard and the people who served in the Civil War. It was something to remind people, if it were on exhibit, that we were a part of this huge conflict uh, that tore our nation apart, and it, it, it's, it's a, an object of reverence and it's an object of memory. And that's the case with a lot of materials that we have in the museum. They're um, a piece of something. Um, here's a, it might be a piece of a ship, or it might be um, a, a little something that looks just like a little piece of rock, but it's actually chipped off of an important place that somebody went to. And it, it's a common historical practice, um, not historical so much as, uh, you know, it's something that people do. And you, you may have things like that at home. Here's a shell that I picked up in a place in, on my honeymoon. It, it has meaning, but the meaning resides not just in the object, but in the memory that goes along with it. And the museum is the place where some of those memories can survive. And that's why something like this, a simple piece of cloth, um, is preserved in a place like the Martha's Vineyard Museum as a way to help preserve that memory. Purchased from Henry Harrison Fisher. 825-1923. Knife of reindeer horn, about 19 inches in length. Used by the Eskimos near Hudson's Bay in cutting snow blocks for their igloos. Given to Henry H. Fisher of Edgartown by John Gifford of New Bedford, about 1885, question mark. Reindeer, called caribou usually when they're um, in North America, don't have horns, they have antlers. So this is a knife made out of the antler of a reindeer or caribou. It is, um, you can see the um, inside um, of, the, of the antler on one side and it's smooth on the other side. And, um, it was used for this purpose, um, but it does show that you have to 
every time you look and get something into the museum, we have to sort of check, check to see whether the story makes sense in terms of the time that it was supposed to have happened, the materials that it's supposed to be made out of, the people who used this originally, and um, there are so many ways to be wrong about something. And, uh, and memory um, is not always reliable. So the person who sold this to the museum um, maybe even said, reindeer antler and somebody wrote down horn because they don't know the difference between horn and antler but all of these tiny details taken together um, if you get one or more of them wrong you can come up with a really wrong story about something um, but the other thing is that it this is such an interesting tool it's an it's an old form and it sends you down another research hole. Who, who used this? What were they doing with it? How was their life changed by the people who now own this? All of these stories are um, a different facet of the history of Martha's Vineyard because people from Martha's Vineyard when they went whaling or when they went to sea would go to these places they would find these things they would bring them home and they would either be a curiosity here's an interesting thing that i picked up want it um here yeah, i'll give this to you as a gift or it, it had some other meaning to the people who were collecting it. Why would somebody want to take something like this? It's an unusual looking thing. Um, it's not expensive looking. What was the interest of this thing? And the thing that interested the people who collected it might not be the same thing that interests us about it now. They might have looked at it as this is an exotic thing. This is something alien, uh, alien to us. Look at this primitive tool that these people use to make these strange looking houses. Um, let me tell you a story that goes along with this. We could take the same object and use it to tell a different story. What is the impact of what we were doing more than 100 years ago, perhaps 150 years ago, 125 years ago, on the people who lived in a particular area that we were going to, to get the natural resources, for example, or to trade, or for any number of, of reasons. You know, how, how did what we do affect their lives. Um, and by we, I mean we, the people of Martha's Vineyard 125 years ago, 150 years ago, because these are long stories. And, um, and the, one of the things I love about museum work is that you can start from one place, purchase this exotic looking thing, and end up in a completely different place. Gift of M. Shepherd, pair of old time blue spectacles. Sometimes things come into the museum because they're obsolete and people don't know what to do with them. I have no idea who used these spectacles. Uh, blue is sort of the old fashioned sunglasses. They're, they're kind of cool in a funny sort of way. But what story did these sunglasses tell without knowing who owned them? And they don't seem to be prescription, so they probably are sunglasses. And so I, I think that without having a whole lot of information, what you have is an old thing. And Old things are interesting, but it would have been so much richer if we had known who wore those. 
what did they, when did they wear them? Do we have any photographs of them wearing them? Probably not, because these were not something that you would wear as a fashion statement. So we can use things like these to tell other stories, stories about how people you know, lived back in the time that these might have been made, but they require a lot of research also. So, so it's sort of like, well, when did people wear glasses that looked like that? Why did they wear blue lenses? Um, I haven't actually done research on this. I, I just looked at the description and was thinking, why? Why is this thing here? And one of the reasons is that it is, it was sort of old fashioned, considered historical a hundred years ago. Um, and so the question is, what do we have around our houses now that you might think, oh, that's useless. I should put it in a museum. Um, and, and then you wonder, well, what would the museum do with it? I mean, so I'm thinking, well, would we have a dial telephone? That's something that, that's sort of lying around the house that, you know, or maybe it's probably in your basement by now. Um, there are many other things that I, I you know, think about them. Um, you know, sort of like, oh, uh, it's a, maybe a, you know, an LP, a record, a phonograph record. And, you know, there was a period of time when we thought those would never be useful again, but now they're coming back into style, they're great audio quality. Um, and so, um, when you think about things that have come into museums and what goes through people's minds when they give them to the museum, sometimes it's just, that an old, that's an old thing, I have no use for it. Maybe somebody will think it looks neat in the future. And I think that that's what this is. Gift of Miss Minnie Norton. Souvenir scallop filled with mounted sea mosses. Made by Mrs. Caroline Crawford about 1895, question mark. This is a tourist thing. It was, there were a lot of these sold on Martha's Vineyard, and we have a lot of them in the collection. They're very um, typical of the sorts of things that people would collect if they went on vacation and they visited Martha's Vineyard. It actually is a scallop shell I'm not sure that these are two halves of the same shell. They look like they could be. And inside are mounted, pressed seaweed, which they called sea mosses. And they're very delicate and, and actually quite lovely. And people um, more recently have made artwork out of out of seaweed, like piece of people like artists like Rose Treat um, in, the, in the 20th century. Um, but back in the day when this was made, right around the turn of the century, um, uh, more than a hundred years ago, um, this sort of thing was a nice occupation for a lady to do uh, and make a little bit of extra money. And, um, and there were a lot of these made. Uh, this is, um, sometimes they were using a shell like this, and sometimes they had, um, they were, pressed into little booklets set with fancy handwriting. Um, but one way or another, these were things that were meant to be saved and um, taken home and to remind you of your trip to the beach um, and the wonderful time that you had. Something that people do nowadays as well, the, um, picking up shells, perhaps buying souvenirs. And so um, this is a nice sense of continuity uh, between Martha's Vineyard more than a hundred years ago and Martha's Vineyard now. And a hundred years ago, somebody thought this is something that should be in the museum so that people will think of Martha's Vineyard, this is a typical part of Martha's Vineyard history. So it's almost like current day collecting. This was not old when it came into the collection of the then historical society. And I think that that's one of the things that people need to keep in mind now, is that we do not need to keep, we do not need to collect um, only old things. We, sometimes we want to have memories of things that are happening right now. And, and it, it might be something that's extraordinary 
um, this is a historical event, or it might be something that's every day, but perhaps ephemeral. If I don't pick this up now, people are not going to remember the way it used to be. And those are two different parts of the memory stories that people save for themselves and that we collect here at the Martha's Vineyard Museum. Gift of Mrs. Everett A. Davis and Mrs. Johnson Whiting, 12 buttons worn during the late war against Germany. And there are 12 buttons here. Some of them are from the Red Cross. Some of them are um, Liberty Loan buttons. Um, some of them have no relationship to the late war against Germany. For example, there's a button here that says Harding and Coolidge. That was a 1920 election. So it was only freshly old when this was donated um, to the museum. Um, and it says, Junior Booster, America First. And so um, this tiny button has a lot of history in it. Um, but it's history that um, people don't necessarily remember right now. But then you think, well, what was happening, uh, you know, in elections more than 100 years ago? Um, you know, think about some of the sayings of the, the you know, slogans um, now versus then. Sometimes things don't change that much. Um, think about the men. Um, you know, I mean, people don't really remember much about Harding, Warren G. Harding, um, and, and even in Calvin Coolidge, the only thing I could remember about him was he had a law office in Northampton and somebody said it looked like he was weaned on a pickle. Those are my two pieces of information before I moved to Martha's Vineyard about 10 years ago. Then um, I saw references to him visiting Martha's Vineyard. Um, he was uh, a Massachusetts man. And, um, and so, um, you know, you, you sort of pick up these, you learn about historical figures, but you learn about them in relation to Martha's Vineyard, um, which is sort of funny when you think about it, because um, that was, Martha's Vineyard wasn't really the Calvin Coolidge story. Um, but it is, you know, important to take the big picture, the big story, and see how it played out in different parts of the country, including right here on the island. And there are a bunch of different, um, different uh, buttons here. Some of them do directly relate to um, the late war against Germany, um, which is World War I. Um, victory loan button. Um, this one says, women's service, war savings. That was one of the things that women uh, participated in um, during wartime. Um, you, you've, I'm sure, heard of victory gardens, but there was also fundraising, um, war bonds, and that kind of thing. And so, the, um, so this was sort of women's um, women's work right on the cusp of getting the right to vote just before that, World War I. Um, and then um, 1920, um, w you know, women did get the right to vote. And so some of these buttons um, can evoke um, a, a distant era of the past that we're now thinking about again. And, um, you know, thinking about things like voting rights, women's right to vote, which women got the right to vote then? Were all women of that particular age allowed to vote? Um, think about some of these stories. Um, and that's all prompted by a tiny little button that says, um, Harding and Coolidge, America first. This portrait has a sad story attached to it. Uh, it came into the museum with this information. Gift of Mrs. Carrie Worth Ray. Oil portrait unframed, 
of Captain Thomas Worth of Edgartown, master of whale ship Globe of Nantucket, murdered by one of his officers while cruising for whales near the Mulgrave Islands in 1823. So Thomas Worth, he was a captain. He was in charge of this vessel. Um, and the mutiny was a sad story, and it was a story that was told um, by some of the members of the ship after he had been killed. They had been stranded on an island for some period of time. It's a story that was told in this book, the, sh the, the um, ship Globe. The name actually is a narrative of the mutiny on board the ship Globe of Nantucket in the Pacific Ocean, January 1924, and the journal of a residence of two years on the Mulgrave Islands. So the, one of the things that I love about this um, in terms of the museum is that this portrait was one of the first things that came into the museum. But this book, a first edition of that account, only came into the museum last year. So it sort of shows the length of time that it might take to pull together all the threads of the story. Um, and we keep working on these things. Now, obviously, we had this information before, but we didn't have the first edition, the real artifact, until just last year. But one of the interesting things about this portrait was that it was taken down at some point, rolled up, and placed in a chart case along with some of this captain's charts, and kept that way for probably about a hundred years. And if you look at the condition of the portrait, you can see the lines across the face of it all the way down where it was rolled up and kept for years. And um, as an aside, if you ever see those heist movies where the burglar sneaks in and cuts the picture out of the frame and rolls it up and, and gets away, um, that is really not good for a painting. And I think that if you look at the details of this painting, you can see what happens, that the paint actually falls away from the canvas in the places where it was rolled up. And this may even have been flattened. So th that kind of helps tell the story. Um, it's incomplete. It might be the story of the grief of the loved ones of this man who couldn't stand to look at the painting anymore after they knew what happened to him. Or it might be um, neglect. The people in the family knew who this was, but he wasn't there. The, theirs. He, they didn't need to be looking at him all the time. They rolled this portrait up and they put it away. We do not actually know the details of that story. But it, it's one of the, this piece in particular allows us to look at this young man's face. He was not very old. He has all of the trappings of a sea captain. He's got his spyglass under his arm. Um, he has a piece of jewelry on his cravat. Um, he's wealthy. He's wealthy enough to have his portrait painted. Um, proud. He's a, he's a ship's captain. He's the master of a whaling ship. And this was left behind with his family when he went out on his final voyage. And then it turned into an entirely different story, the story of mutiny. Uh, I'm not going to go into the details of the story because it's really readily available. And I would recommend that you, it's, it's a harrowing story. Um, and it is in this book and other versions of this book. Um, and so if you look at the various, this is sort of by the people who were on the ship, not the murderers, but uh, the people who were on the ship. And um, it's poignant. And it's one of those stories that 
you have a lot of detail, but then you can also use your imagination to fill in some of the blanks. Um, and, and that's one of the things that I find the most interesting about this story, which takes the Martha's Vineyard Museum from its very founding until the present day.